brought some, I dotted some Bibles around. If you're lucky enough to have one on your seat, you don't win anything. I put a load on that row where no one sat, interestingly. Yeah. You might have to share one between two or whatever, but um, I'm going to use some other little bits of Bible. Um, so just to check I'm not making it up, really. I'm going to read this passage again. We're in 2 Kings chapter 6, and we're starting at verse 8, and it's titled in my Bible, Elisha Traps Blinded Arameans. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God, Elisha, sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord and king, said one of his officers. But Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go, find out where he is, the king ordered, so that I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, Oh, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all round Elisha. As the enemy came down towards him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked. And there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill men you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Uh, for this theme this morning of recognizing you in our everyday lives. Thank you for this passage uh, in Two Kings, and we just pr pray right now that you'd open it up to us. Help us to be ready to hear what you've got to say this morning. And not just to hear it and forget, but to hear it and, uh, and use it this week, to use the challenge that you've given us to get to know you better. Amen. Lovely, have a little wiggle, get comfy. Very good, Dave. <laughs> Nudge the person next to you if they've already nodded off. Thanks, Doreen. <laughs> so, as we've already talked about, this week's theme in our Treasure Hunter series is recognising God. We want to grow in our ability to recognise what God is doing in our everyday lives. I am. Um, I don't know if you've heard of a place called Alton Towers. To be honest, you're not really its target audience. Um, but uh, there is a theme park. I think it's probably the biggest theme park in the country. It's called Alton Towers. It's down Staffordshire Way, and. Um, 
it's brilliant. You can't generally go to it in a day. Um, you need a few days to get around it because there's so many people there. It takes hours to queue. and um, It's kind of every teenager's dream, I guess. And, and when I was about 11 or 12, I can remember, I'm not sure, I think it was maybe a youth group trip um, from the Lake District. We didn't get out much, so this was a big deal, getting out of the Lake District to go to Alton Towers. <laughs> and... Um, so we were really excited, and it was nothing. We talked about nothing else for weeks before, and um, the day came, and we got. Uh, I think we were in cars. We drove down to Alton Towers, and we knew that it would be really, really busy. So we thought well, we need to pick maybe a couple of rides that we want to go on first, so that we definitely get to go on those. And for me, the two rides that I wanted to go on was the Log Flume and uh, the River Rapids. Now the log flume is probably bigger and better than you're thinking. It's an amazing log flume. And so I thought, right, that's where we'll go first. So me and some of my friends, uh, we decided that's where we were heading. So as soon as the gates opened, we legged it as fast as we could to the log flume. We didn't have to queue very long, we got on there. And then after the log flume, the next ride, which was next door, was the River Rapids. And this is kind of like, you kind of went down this river of rapids uh, on a massive kind of inflatable tyre. And um, we were desperate to get on it. And I can remember running off the log flume, soaking wet, and running towards the river rapids. The problem was, I was so keen to get there, that I wasn't really looking at anything else apart from maybe about two foot in front of me. I was focused on the floor and I was running. And it was all going fine until a wheelchair was coming the other way. And I didn't notice it because my head was down. And sure enough, my shins went straight into this wheelchair. And they're a bit brutal wheelchairs. You don't mess with them. And I had to go, I messed up all my shins and I had to go to the first aid place and get sorted out and I ended up missing my go on the river rapids but I was in so much of a rush to get to my next ride that my head was down and I was just charging on without taking in what was around me at that particular moment and I wonder if that's what we do sometimes in our own lives we're kind of so involved in ourselves and what's going on in our lives that we're kind of looking down completely focused on our current situation when actually God calls us to be a people with our heads that are looking up at him and what he is doing. I don't know if you've been to the pictures recently, or recently, maybe the last few years, <laughs> let's say, but the latest craze is for 3D films. I'm not very technical, but 3D, it, it basically, it's like you're in it. Is that right? Yeah? So you watch it, and it's like you're there in the whatever you're watching. I don't know. First World War, if you're watching Saving Private Ryan or something like that. Wherever you are, it feels like you're there in the moment. But it does require you to do something. For you to feel like you're in that film and you're right there and there's stuff flying at you and all that stuff, you have to put on a rather fetching pair of glasses. And one side is red and the other side is blue. If you don't wear those 3D glasses, then the cinema, the film, is just going to look a bit weird and a bit blurred and you're not going to get the most out of the film. To get the most out of it, to get the full picture, you need to wear those glasses. In the same way, when we begin to use our, kind of our spiritual eyes or our spiritual glasses, then we start to get the full picture. We begin to recognize what he's doing. We see God's big picture. We're going to have a look at that uh, in this morning's passage. I'm going to split it into three. So we're going to look firstly at verses 8 to 14, and then verses 15 to 17, and then verses 18 to 23. So I'm going to read it again. You're going to know this passage word for word. So I'm going to read verses, just verses 8 up to 14. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel, 
After conferring with his officers, he said, I'll set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord and king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go, find out where he is, the king ordered, so that I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. The background to the story is this. God's people, the Israelites, are having a few problems with the country of Aram. Or, interestingly, that's Syria today. Um, And we can see, if we, like, scoot right to the end, verses 23 and 24... The problem at the minute for the Israelites was basically groups of marauders coming over the borders to attack. So I'm imagining there was little groups of Arameans and they'd kind of, element of surprise, charge in, rob them and then get back out again. Um, If you look in 24, okay, that talks more um, later on that the Arameans were attacking um, as a big army. So they're, they're trying to surprise the Israelites with their attacks. They wanted to catch them unprepared. One of Marissa's favourite games at the minute is hide and seek. And um, we usually play it in the garden. And um, bless her, Marissa thinks she's brilliant at it. And actually, the reality is she's rubbish. <laughs> but what we do is um, we kind of... Uh, I go and hide first, so Marissa will stand somewhere and she'll start to count. And I go and hide and then she walks around the garden and she tries to find me. Sometimes she finds me quickly, sometimes it takes a while. Um, But then we swap over, so I count and she hides. And she thinks she's brilliant. The problem is she either hides in exactly the same place where I just hid or... She'll go and hide somewhere. This is a general problem in our house. But she'll hide somewhere and then she'll just talk the whole time. (laughs) So you can hear her. You could do it blindfolded because you just follow her voice. She can't keep quiet for long enough for me to find her. She thinks she's great. And, you know, I guess that was the same with the Arameans. They thought they were surprising the Israelites. But actually, the Israelites knew exactly where they were going to attack thanks to Elisha. If you've got this, these, the king of Aram, he's saying, right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go over there and we'll attack there. We'll attack Judith, the Israelite, there. Okay, that's where we'll attack. The problem is, God's speaking to Elisha, Dave, and, and Elisha is just telling the king, Billy, and he's saying, look, Billy, what you want to do? Get some soldiers over here because they're going to attack there. So, these Arameans, they come charging towards Judith, and they're like, oh, no, there's already an army there. Behind her there, them two. <laughs> Not that scary. But it put the Arameans off, and they, <laughs> <laughs> and they went, oh, we'll go back. And this happened time and time again. Every time they attacked, The Israelites knew where they were going. And the king of Aram, he thought, well, there must be a traitor in the ranks. And then they discover that actually it's Elisha. And he's telling them where to go. And so the king obviously gets a little bit annoyed. The king of Aram is like, this can't go on. We've got to capture this man. So they find out that he's in Dothan. And he sends off a big army and he's going to capture him. And uh, that will solve the problem. The first thing I reckon we can learn from this passage, from that bit there, those few verses, is that if we are beginning to recognise what God's doing in our everyday lives, then we should also be very aware of what the devil is doing in our everyday lives. In our story, the Israelites knew exactly where the Arameans were going to attack because God was telling Elisha. 
God was protecting them. It would have been pretty crazy for them to ignore the warnings and therefore God's protection. And yet that is so often what we do. We need to be prepared for Satan's attacks and we should be ready for them. The exciting news this morning is that God has given us everything that we need to withstand Satan's attacks. There it is up there. The armour of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled round your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. God has given us everything we need to withstand Satan's attacks. The Israelites knew from the prophet Elisha that the Arameans were going to attack and they were ready for them. They didn't ignore God and we should be able to recognize Satan's attacks and be ready for them with the armor of God. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11 says this, it says, Satan will not outsmart us for we are very familiar with his evil schemes. You think we would be foolish not to be ready for these attacks, and yet how many times do we ignore God's protection and feel the full weight of those attacks? Don't let the devil get the better of you. Stand firm, put on the armour, and you'll begin to recognise God's protection in your life. Judith does a great job with this water. And uh, what is that? Is that a trick? <laughs> it's water. Yeah. Just look at that closely, Dave. How full is that? Half full. Which one, Dave? <laughs> you would say half full. Would anyone else say that was half full? Who would say it was half empty? Frank. <laughs> half full, half empty? I don't know. I don't know what kind of person you are. Maybe you looked at it and saw that it was half full. Maybe you saw it half empty. We had a deacons meeting this Thursday. And um, we were talking about the food bank and um, Steve was saying he had a meeting with Mark and uh, they were talking and Steve said, you know, who knows what will happen in the future. Maybe in five, ten years there won't be a need for a food bank. And wouldn't that be exciting if there wasn't a need? And then Doug pipes up, oh no, no, <laughs> no. He said there'll never not be a need now. When the government takes something off you, they never give it you back. <laughs> but it's a bit half empty, Doug. <laughs> Let's read verse 15 and 16 and 17. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all round 
Elisha. Elisha's servant, maybe he was a half-empty kind of person. He woke early in Dothan, he got up, he left Elisha sleeping, and he went for a walk. And he walked around Dothan, he walked to the edge of the city, and it was then that he saw the Arameans circling the city. And he panicked, and he ran straight back to ask Elisha what on earth they were going to do. And Elisha very calmly, I'm sure, tells the servant not to worry, because his side was far greater than the Arameans. Elisha saw the full picture. He had his 3D glasses on. He recognized God. He saw the bigger picture, and he prays to God to reveal it all to his servant. God does just that and suddenly the servant sees the whole hillside filled with heavenly warriors. Can you imagine? He's gone out the first time and he's looked and all he's seen was the enemy. He's gone back to Elisha. He's gone back out after seeing Elisha and suddenly he can see God's army all over the hillside. Thousands and thousands and thousands. Who are you like? Are you the servant, totally unprepared for Satan's attacks, which cause you to fret and to worry? Or are you like Elisha? Can you recognize God in the situations that you find yourself in? That same, I can guarantee that same heavenly army is there for you as it was for Elisha. Do you recognize them? Can you see them at work? Maybe you need to pray that prayer and ask God to reveal himself. Psalm 127, verses 1 to 3, says this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Following God certainly doesn't make our lives problem free. In fact, often Satan can attack us all the more. But what an amazing truth from Psalm 127. I had a different hymn pick for the start. I can't remember what it was. Guide me, thou great Jehovah, I think. But as I was writing this, uh, those words, blessed assurance, just kept coming into my head. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. What a truth. Elisha had that blessed assurance that God was with him. That God's strength was greater than anything the world could throw at him. Can you imagine having that full assurance that Elisha had? Why can't, why can't we have that same assurance, that same trust, that same faith that Elisha had in that situation? If we learn to fully recognize God in our daily lives, surely we would have that same assurance, that same confidence in our God. And then we would experience all the riches that a life with God has. Verse 18. As the enemy came down towards him, Elisha prayed to God, strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill men you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. 
The final part of the story, Elisha prays and asks God to blind the Arameans, which God duly does. Elisha then tells the blind men that they're looking for Elisha in the wrong place, and he leads them to Samaria. Apparently, technically this wasn't a lie, and because that was where Elisha was from. Presumably, at this point, they get to Samaria, and there's a huge, big Israelite army. The king was there, so I'm guessing he didn't travel alone. I'm guessing there was a bit of an army waiting to greet these Arameans. Can you imagine being one of those Aramean soldiers, and you're blinded, and then you walk somewhere, and then you get there, and then when you open your eyes, you can see again you're surrounded by the enemy. I'm sure they were expecting the worst. But what happens is a bit like, I'm guessing what, well, what happens when you really upset a parent? You know, when, from my experience, when your parent is a bit mad with you, they like start, they shout at you, they'd raise their voice, they'd be a bit cross. But when they were really, 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 really annoyed with you, they wouldn't. They'd say something like, they'd just be calm and quiet, and they'd say something like, I'm really disappointed in you. And at that point, you know that you're really in trouble. But it usually gets a better response. And here's another example of Elisha recognizing God in a situation and doing exactly what he wanted. The king of Israel, if you read there, says to Elisha, should we kill them? Should, can you imagine? He's got, he's got his enemy right there. He's got them and he's like, well, let's kill them. Can we kill them? Let's kill them now. But no. These people, they'd been a threat to the king for a long time and this was his chance to get rid of them. But he asks Elisha if that's the right thing to do and Elisha takes that different view. He recognizes God at work and he feeds his enemy before letting them go. God's plan was to use the enemy as an opportunity to show his love, his kindness, and his mercy. And Elisha gave others the opportunity to recognize God at work. Do you give others that same opportunity? As we begin to recognize God at work in our everyday lives, then we need to be people that learn to give those people around us the opportunity to recognize God at work. That is a rubbish sentence. Do you get what I'm saying? As we begin to recognize God in our lives, then we need to let others in on that as well. And we need to let them recognize God at work. I've always been struck by a lady called G. Walker. And she had a son um, killed in Highton in Liverpool. Do you remember Anthony Walker? I think he was at a bus stop. And two blokes killed him with an axe or something horrible. And she was a Christian. She goes to a church in Liverpool. And, and she came out a little bit after that and, um, and said that she forgave those killers. And she's met with those killers. And um, incredible, really. But what she's done is she's given others the chance to see, to recognize God at work in that situation. And I'm sure that for some people who were in Samaria that day, there was a realization that the God of Israel is the one true God. For others, I'm sure they just went back to their ordinary, normal lives and it didn't affect them. But when people recognize God in their lives, then it changes them. Who is recognizing God through you and through your life? I was thinking about uh, that game. Do you remember Guess Who? Where you have all those, some people are looking blank me, but you have all those people on your board and then the other person has them. And you have, to, you have to work out who the other person has chosen. You have to recognize them. The more you play that game, Guess Who, the better you get at it because you start to recognize the characters in the game. And it's the same with God. Maybe this whole idea of recognizing God outside of a church building in your normal life is new to you. Maybe you're going to give it a go and you won't really be sure if you're recognizing God or not. But remember that game of guess who. The more you play, 
the better you'll be at recognising. The more you look for God in everyday situations, the better you'll be able to recognise him at work in your life. Let's remember this morning that if we start to recognise God at work, then we'll also start to recognise that Satan is at work too. Don't let your life situations get you down or freak you out because verse 16 says, don't be afraid for there are more on our side than on theirs. There's more, if we're a follower of God, there's more on our side than there is on his. And finally, give others the opportunity to recognise God at work in their everyday lives. It's so exciting. God is at work in your life every minute of every day. Can you imagine how amazing it would be to recognise him at work in your life every minute, every day, in every situation, in the good situations, in the bad situations? <laughs> it's a bit cheesy this, but I came up with it and I love it. <laughs> One of the greatest Christian perks is to see that God is at work. You like that, don't you, Doug? It rhymes. One of the greatest Christian perks is to see that God is at work. Look out for him because it will change your perspective on everything. Let's pray. <coughs> Father God, thank you for this story in Two Kings. Thank you for Elisha and for the way that he, he recognised you in every situation. Help us to do the same. Help us to, to look out for you, to be aware of you with us every minute of every day. And give us opportunity to show that to other people too. So that they may recognise you at work. Be with us this week. Help us not to forget this message. But to take it with us. And to get to know you better through it. Amen. <laughs>